In the final days before launch, Kennedy Space Center's quality control teams pour over every inch of the shuttle, looking for any imperfection, knowing that even one loose screw could mean disaster on launch day. It's all an incredibly detailed process with multiple checks and rechecks performed right up until SRB ignition. What we do is we manage all the test activities and try and make sure that everything happens and happens so we can get to launch countdown. And we're the last uh, people that say anything to the flight crew when they get on board. This is a team effort, so we like to tell them that everybody's thinking of them, and that tells them that, hey, we're getting ready to launch. Turn on your oxygen, because we're going to be going for a ride. At that moment, our lives are in the hands of the Kennedy Space Center ground crew and the thoroughness with which they've done their jobs. The process starts out with a lot of activity and a murmur of noise as the clock gets closer to zero, things quiet down, things settle down, and you can sense that people are more focused on, on what's about to happen. And there's a lot of energy and a lot of anticipation. Silence falls over the team in the firing room as the clock ticks down, and months of hard work culminate in a few final seconds. And when the shuttle lifts off, every member of the Kennedy Space Center shuttle team goes with it in spirit. Each one of them knows they had to do their job well in order to enjoy that safe and successful mission. They're the most dedicated, greatest group of people I've ever had the pleasure to work with. As you can see, it takes a lot more than rocket fuel to make the shuttle fly. It takes a team. And even more than that, it takes a nation of hearts, souls, and minds, all reaching for the stars. From there, you'll go into the second attraction, the Rocket Plaza. Food and beverage courts and restrooms are there, but also suspended from the ceiling is the huge Saturn V moon rocket. Much of our work in space involves satellites. A shuttle mission might launch a new satellite, fix a broken one, or return an orbiting satellite to Earth. We carry the satellites in the orbiter's cargo bay. Satellites can range from the size of a basketball to the size of a bus. Satellites serve many functions for us here on Earth. When you telephone a friend in Paris and you hear him clear as a bell, that's a satellite making a perfect connection. Weather satellites have saved lives by giving early warnings of storms. Other satellites monitor Earth for pollution, new energy sources, and food crops. And the satellite, like the Hubble, brings us never-before-seen images of distant galaxies. We also perform scientific experiments in space that have breakthrough potential in many areas. For instance, the weightless environment allows us to separate chemicals into a pure form, which might eventually be used to make more effective medicine. Yellow 300 over there, you're right. <laughs> Excuse me, all the way over here to the right. Give me a bee-belt the little bay door. <coughs> Just kept over that little bay door for the seat, the little bay door over here to right. Kept over there about five days. Then it's moved back over the high bay door area. Right down here, the left front of the bus is the press facility. That's three and a half miles from the pad. That's as close as anyone can get when they shuttle be in line. Three and a half miles. The vehicle assembly building is now the third of the fourth largest building in the world, and that's by volume, not height. 129 million cubic. We like to tell you each star painted on the side as part of the flag measure six feet across. Each stride, you can put a nice house up there with a pool in the backyard. Lots of space. <laughs> <laughs> Sally has flown twice aboard the shuttle. She's going to tell you some of very important ones. Al, have you ever cleaned up with a dustbuster vacuum? Sure. Well, that's a byproduct of space technology. So are scratch-proof sunglasses, home water filters, and a thousand other products I could name. The cars we drive and the airplanes we fly were probably designed with the help of software developed for NASA. But certainly among the most important spin-offs are the ones in medicine. Yeah, my best friend's dad recently had a rechargeable pacemaker put in, and he was very surprised to hear that this state-of-the-art device was a spin-off from a communication system developed by NASA. That's right. CAT scans, portable x-ray machines, laser surgery. And all these new products mean new companies and new jobs, don't they? Absolutely. More than 30 years ago, Congress mandated that NASA pass along the technology it develops to the private sector. This technology transfer program has opened doors for entire new industries. 
interrupting Sal agent from time to time. So we're looking for the Gator Patrol. Uh, there he is, over there on the alley. Sound asleep as usual. Don't fly, Curry, in these rockets. The economic impact on the country has been tremendous. It's a narrowly complex undertaking as the exploration of space gives inspiration to everyone. It shows us the endless possibilities of human endeavor. You know, in 1962, when John Glenn became the first American to orbit the Earth, he named his spacecraft Friendship 7 to convey to the world that he was exploring in the spirit of friendship. The fact that... And some visual aids like red and white lights that when properly lined up indicate the proper glide slope. The orbiter approaches the runway at a very steep angle, about six times steeper than a typical commercial jet. To the right diagonally, you'll see that mess coming up. It's coming up right here, second row back. There it is, it's big. Right there it is, we're coming up abreast of it. Right. Now, right where this electric pole is, there's an opening in the trees, right here. Look back, you'll see it. Crew quarters on the third floor of operations and checkout. That's where I slept the night before all my missions. And today, the crew of the space shuttle still uses it as their home away from home. Now, this building on the right they've been talking about, ONC operations and checkout. That ain't what we called it back during Apollo days. That was the manned space operations building, so we called it the MSO building. That's for real. Welcome to the International Space Station Center. This incredible facility is divided into two sections. hard to believe over 30 years have gone by. Back then, nobody would have believed we'd put a man on the moon in less than a decade. As for a permanent space station where people lived and worked was concerned, well, that was just science fiction. You know, even though we've been training and preparing for this day for the last 25 years, there's still a part of me that finds it hard to believe I'm fortunate enough to be part of the team that's actually going to carry the first U.S. piece of the International Space Station into orbit. Dreams can come true. Sprawling over an area the size of two football fields, the International Space Station is so large, you'll be able to see it from the ground as it passes overhead. The International Space Station represents the combined efforts of over a dozen nations from around the world, dedicated to one common goal, improving life on Earth. With seven laboratory modules, where research can be conducted in near zero gravity, the space station will allow researchers to study materials that could not exist in processes that could not take place here on Earth. Researchers are especially excited about the ability to grow ultra-pure protein crystals, critical to medical research. You see, without the effects of gravity, scientists get a truer picture of the cell structure, and with this understanding, it may be possible to move more quickly to cures for diseases like cancer and AIDS. Now, of course, there is just one little thing that needs to happen before all these miraculous discoveries can take place. We'll have to build and assemble the largest, most complex structure ever to be placed in orbit. Assembling the space station will require 38 space flights on three different types of launch vehicles from the United States and Russia over a five-year period, delivering modules, truss segments, resupply vessels, solar arrays, thermal radiators, and all the multitude of other supplies and equipment needed to make the space station habitable. Once in orbit, structures weighing thousands of pounds can be maneuvered into place by spacewalking astronauts without the negative effects of gravity. 
will also be responsible for routing electrical and fluid lines and mounting numerous fittings. The way I look at it, we're going to be the most glorified construction workers going by the time we get back to Earth. But I'm ready for it. I've been ready ever since I was a kid who dreamed of flying and watched in wonder as our astronauts explored space. So, <coughs> as you tour the exhibits today and look out over the high bay at pieces of the space station being made ready for an incredible voyage, remind yourself that an international space station was a dream that seemed impossible just 25 years ago. Today, we're exploring the next generation of spacecraft, seeking to improve life on this planet for our children and our children's children. When you consider all we've accomplished in just the last few decades alone, it's easy to believe in a future of infinite possibility. Starting right here with the first piece of the International Space Station. A journey bounded only by the limits of our imagination and the willingness of the next generation of Americans to soar higher and higher in their quest for knowledge, their love of adventure, and their desire to go beyond their dreams.